Sound check. It is not on. Sound check. Now it's okay. No. No. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, okay. Sound check. Hillman, the topic of the next press conference is critical infrastructure protection and chemical security systems needs and possibilities for Ukraine. And uh, we are pleased to welcome here Vaidota Sverba, OEC project coordinator in Ukraine. David Wolf, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure Protection, U.S. Department of Homeland Security. And Krzysztof Paturei, President of the Board, International Center for Chemical, Chemical Safety and Security. Um, the floor is yours. Maybe I do first. Uh, actually, today uh, in, in Kiev, we called uh, for the International Roundtable about the topics we just mentioned about the uh, protection of uh, not only chemical but critical infrastructure of Ukraine and also uh, about the chemical safety and security system in Ukraine as well. Uh, the aim of this uh, particular you know, round table was to bring together main stakeholders from the uh, Ukraine, from Ukraine, national stakeholders plus international uh, community. And um, uh, since uh, OEC project coordinator works in this country already for uh, more than 20 years, so we are well positioned to bring together international experts and expertise in order to support Ukrainian reform. Needless to say that protection of critical infrastructure reform and the new system is a one probably of the most important reforms for the country today. So therefore, I'm particularly pleased that uh, we've been honored uh, that uh, to our roundtable came uh, representatives from various you know countries and institutions first of all uh, david wolf you know assistant secretary of homeland security of the us and uh, also the Euro representatives of the european union and also representatives of poland different institutions and also ambassador Krzysztof patrey of uh, polish international center for chemical safety and security in warsaw and uh, we actually uh, gathered here in, uh, in, in Ukraine already not to tell each other what we're doing. It's already well known, at least among the expert community, what, who is doing what and, and how. But uh, we gathered here in order to uh, cooperate and collaborate together with the Ukrainian colleagues on these particular topics. And, uh, and also just look for the way forward, who can bring what and how we can proceed further. So without further ado, I, I'd like maybe to pass uh, for a few introductory words to David Wolf. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Ambassador. Uh, and I have to say, uh, really such a, uh, such a privilege to have been invited to participate um, in this very important uh, round table. We've had some, uh, some really great uh, discussions uh, so far uh, this morning, um, sharing um, lessons um, we have learned in the United States as we have developed our framework for critical infrastructure protection uh, and uh, it has been uh, really great to hear about all the progress that is being made here in Ukraine in the development of a, uh, a framework for protecting critical infrastructure. So very excited to be here, to be part of the uh, dialogue uh, and certainly uh, we in the United States uh, remain very uh, committed to continuing uh, coordination and collaboration to sharing um, with Ukraine and to learning from one another as we, uh, we work uh, respectively to ensure that critical infrastructure is protected uh, against all range of, uh, of threats. Uh, those certainly include uh, terrorism, uh, cyber attack, uh, natural hazards, among um, among many others, uh, and you know, really, there is no question um, but that the the threat 
to critical infrastructure, uh, and that includes um, to, uh, to uh, chemical facilities as well, uh, is as real a threat and as relevant a threat as it ever has been. So I think this round table and the work that is being done in Ukraine um, now around uh, the protection of critical infrastructure really could not be uh, more timely or more important. So, Ambassador Potray. As a moderator of the roundtable, uh, I was very much positively taken by the attitude of Ukrainian and international partners who, in very open way, presented the ways and means and problems how to strengthen critical infrastructure and how to link critical infrastructure in Ukraine with the international partners. What was uh, an important feature of the event is uh, multi-stakeholder approach. We, we came to the round table as representatives from governments, international organizations, civil society, and academia. This is a true, very important objective. We also collected people from the local level because what is critically important in protecting critical infrastructure is engagement of all actors from local level to regional to central levels. Therefore, we believe that this event is an important step in assisting Ukraine to introduce modern infrastructure protection, but also an important step for world community to link with Ukraine approaches. And there is no safe country if there is, is no safe, if there is no safety for other countries, critical infrastructure is one of these elements which can unite security. And from that context, we believe that the round table was a very important step in uniting countries to enhance security through joint work on critical infrastructure protection. And uh, uh, just one, one more thing just to say, uh, on, on the rights of, of the probably the host of this round table, uh, I, I should say that um, OEC project coordinator in Ukraine, we already for two and a half years been working with the uh, projects on chemical safety and security. And today actually we're going to present and again to announce of the fourth project which is uh, targeted and mainly aimed to support Ukrainian uh, authorities in, in tackling chemical threats in the east of the country. So, and this is, now need to say why it is important, because you journalists, you are covering, uh, covering news every, every single day, single hour, and you know that chemical threats been in a conflict zone, been uh, always, you know, an issue maybe not very well perceived by the population, or well advertised, maybe you don't need to advertise this, but nevertheless for the experts and for us who, who see the situation, is, therefore it's very much important and we'll be very pleased that we, uh, we're gonna continue our work with the State Emergency Service of Ukraine in supporting them uh, to respond to chemical threats in the east of the, eastern part of the country. So therefore uh, maybe this is something I, what, what I wanted to say as an introduction, and right now um, we are more than pleased to to listen your remarks and questions, and then we'll be, uh, I think so, we'll be engaging in the questions and answer session. Thank you. Thank you for your more remarks. Let's pass to Q and A session, uh, ladies and gentlemen. You are please, uh, you are welcome to ask questions if you have them. Don't be shy. <laughs> well. Uh, I would like to clarify about what particular project the question is. You have mentioned the fourth project on the protection. And a bit more, a bit more uh, just about what steps are to be taken. The question is also about the criminal infrastructure protection from natural disasters. For example, uh, let the, uh, to the just last night, because of the strong shower, 
some some districts of the city were covered with water a small collapse uh, wha what about that what measures can be taken and should be taken and to what extent uh, Kiev is ready to such uh, accidents um, well I certainly I'm not sure what I can assess whether Kiev is ready for that this kind of uh, rea uh, you know actions against national disasters but uh, let me answer uh, well, the, uh, the first part of the question about the uh, fourth project. It's, uh, well, the, it's quite a bureaucratic title of the project, but it's to enhance uh, capability of the Ukrainian uh, authorities to respond to the chemical threats in the eastern part of the country. It means uh, everybody knows about the water filtration, Donetsk water filtration station and all the ac series of accidents around this. And uh, s s all the services, state emergency service and, and the first responders have to be uh, able, know what to do. They should have equipment, they should have proper training. Public has to be uh, aware of that. All the authority, not only uh, you know, uh, responders, but also the, the whole society and all the governmental uh, and also uh, society institutions have to be uh, ready if something, something is happening. So they, they have to know how to react, how to act. Because uh, for those who are knowledgeable about chemical threats, you know that chemicals have no borders. The, the very dangerous, no, no borders, and usually very uh, small period of time to react. Therefore, authorities have to be ready, and uh, we've been requested by the Ukrainian authorities as an international organization to support uh, well, authorities in this endeavor, and this project is going to is going to uh, be very beginning of, of this support, including, of course, some equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, uh, uh, what uh, sort of impact we will make, I think so it's better to say uh, after some time, after some time when this project will be already in, in place and also Ukrainian authorities will be also able to answer themselves for themselves, how they would support. But, but uh, from... Uh, uh, perspective of international community is very much important that the country uh, is able to react. That country is able, it has capacity, it knows how to do, you know, this, and also population and the policymakers are ready. Uh, and with, with regard to the national disasters, I, I definitely want to pass a, a mic to Dave because I, I think so he's much more knowledgeable how they in US they do this because recently. Not recently, so you just mentioned one, uh, one uh, e sort of last year's, uh, well, thing in Puerto Rico. So I think so. This is something uh, similar, not really. <laughs> uh, yeah, th th thankfully that was not a hurricane-scale uh, storm last night, but certainly a, uh, a large, uh, large storm. Um, and uh, yes, uh, absolutely. Um, with respect to critical infrastructure protection in the United States, we certainly try to take uh, what we call an all hazards approach. So, you know, we work with critical infrastructure owners and operators, um, many of whom are found uh, in the private sector. Uh, I think I heard this morning that 78% of critical infrastructure in Ukraine is owned uh, and operated by private um, private industry. Um, and we, uh, we work as an extended critical infrastructure community um, to uh, find ways to um, provide incentives um, to those companies and those other entities that operate critical infrastructure um, to build in both security and resilience features as they are designing, um, as they are uh, making improvements to infrastructure so that, uh, you know, in the face of a major storm or other natural disaster, um, it will be easier to um, bring infrastructure back uh, online. Uh, that is something that, as the ambassador mentioned, we have been confronting over the past year um, in response to the major hurricanes um, we experienced uh, and we continue to work on the island of Puerto Rico um, to build back 
critical infrastructure. And as we do that, um, our goal is to build it back um, better than it was before and uh, in a way that is more capable of withstanding um, future natural disasters. Thank you for this question because it was very practical and there it's really to answer you directly, yes. By good system of crit critical infrastructure protection, you increase the resilience against threats, all threats, whether it's terrorism, whether it's, nat it's, whether it's natural threat or any other threat. Because people who are responsible for this infrastructure are well trained, are well prepared to deal with emergencies and contingencies. Therefore, again, when we speak about critical infrastructure protection, we, we speak about increasing resilience against all kinds of threats. We discuss mainly the threats in the east of Ukraine due to the reasons, clear reasons of ongoing conflict. But this example of natural, natural disaster uh, happening last night is a good example that if you introduce effective infrastructure protection you are, you are much better prepared and the losses are much lower. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And we have one more question. I suppose it will be in Ukrainian. Uh, RBK Ukraine. Uh, Mr. Wolf, uh, can you comment? Have you analyzed the Ukrainian laws in this domain? Can you give some parallels in what way this system should operate in Ukraine? What are the differences of Ukraine from other countries? Not to have uh, just uh, to implement uh, additional projects with some international relations, but for this system to operate in Ukraine properly, what laws should be passed in Ukraine to sustain that? Uh, I, I appreciate the uh, appreciate the question, uh, and I will say that um, based on the uh, based on the briefings we received this morning. Um, from the um, from the uh, security services and from the, uh, the the Ukraine security services. Am I getting the agency right? Uh, and the Ministry of uh, Economy and Justice, I believe the uh, the legislation that has been uh, developed um, here is absolutely on the uh, on the right track. Uh, it is uh, very clearly designed. Um, to align with sort of international approaches and with the approach we've taken in the United States to building a critical infrastructure uh, protection framework. Uh, it's designed to uh, encourage public-private partnerships um, in the, um, in the uh, protection of critical infrastructure uh, and you know, certainly uh, appears to be uh, on track to take uh, what we call a, a risk-based approach to prioritizing and protecting um, the, uh, the most critical, uh, critical infrastructure. Uh, and so, you know, my, my assessment is that, uh, is that Ukraine is absolutely on the right track. And, you know, again, uh, we are very much, uh, very much eager to continue uh, cooperation and coordination as the uh, the critical infrastructure uh, framework continues to develop uh, here in uh, in Ukraine. Thank you for the question. Uh, not just to um, add something what David said because I I, I don't add something. But uh, when you talk about the legislative part, uh, you know it's very, always very much important to remember that uh, legislation is not just a law. You know the whole regulatory system is a is a issue is a problem, usually in the countries because how actually you implement this law, and it also implies collaboration between different institutions because this law, and uh, it's not going to be implemented by a single institution. It's actually, uh, you know, it's going to be implemented by the whole country. So it's not not by accident. We just mentioned public-private partnerships, and. It, this is happening all over the world, the United States, the European Union, and this is the only way to go in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one question from a person who haven't been asking yet, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Voice of America, Ruslan Dinichenko. Uh, uh, of course, you know that not all the dangerous objects are situated on the 
part of Ukraine that is controlled by Ukrainian government, and there are some dangerous objects that are situated in, uh, uh, in Donbass that are controlled by, by Russia. Uh, how you think the, uh, how you estimate the, the risk that this object can be used as a, as a weapon of mass destruction, and how you think the Ukrainian government and Ukraine should address this, this issue? Thank you so much. Okay, maybe I'll start because it's more like domain of the OC, because we are present in the country. Uh, not by accident, I mentioned that chemical threats uh, have no boundaries. So there is no contact line for chemical threat, just to put it like this. And uh, our mandate as a project coordinator, OC project coordinator in Ukraine, uh, is that we do cover the whole territory of Ukraine, so de, de facto. Uh, and, uh, but because of some reasons, we cannot do something in the certain areas of, of the country. And uh, uh, just to be very short, I, we signaled already to different uh, formats of, how to say, negotiations. You know, for example, I can confess that I myself been working for the, uh, some people who just participate in the in Minsk negotiations. I signaled many times that uh, the, parties should use advantage that OEC is, is taking a lead in these issues. And uh, regardless, uh, regardless uh, the very acute military and, uh, and political questions which are being discussed, these are the other things which concern just people without, uh, if, and these uh, threats can, can threaten actually population, you know, without taking into consideration the allegiance to, of, of, of these people. So therefore, uh, that was signaled. But de facto, unfortunately, uh, so we don't have, uh, I would say, much to say in, in this. And I, I dare hope that, that people do know and responsible politicians do know about that. And uh, also, uh, what, uh, what I try to say many times in many forests, particularly in Vienna, in the, in the Permanent Council of the OEC, where uh, all the you know, members, are, participating states are represented, all the delegations that, uh, you know, if there is a political will, just we can always find a solution. We can always find a solution how OC can help expertise uh, wise or, you know, awareness raising wise, etc., etc. Uh, so the, everything is there, but uh, unfortunately, so far, so no, nothing has happened in, in, in this field. Uh, again, I say, unfortunately. And uh, well, what you just mentioned, uh, using certain things as a chemical weapon, that's something new. You know, I haven't, uh, uh, I haven't heard any, anybody, but uh, I, I can assure you it would be, uh, how should we say, I mean, very, very uh, sort of uh, hardly imaginable thing. Because as I said, you know, you, you never, when uh, you remember in 2016, when they, there was some kind of first, at least, Covered, uh, you know, hit to a Devka, you know, water purification station. So, and then, and then, I had a conversations with the with the first responders in the east there, on the on the uh, of the government controlled territory, and people were scared to death because they didn't know when this chlorine cloud and where it will go, because where where wind blows, you know. That's why I I can hardly imagine, you know, saying people. I mean, not insane, but, no, but insane people just uh, uh, of thinking of doing such kind of thing uh, in, 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 in this area and the area somewhere else. So this would be, from my point of view, very much you know, outrageous. But, but in any case, we try to deliver uh, to messages through different channels to all possible you know, uh, factions that this is really, uh, chemical threats are really uh, dangerous and, uh, and very much an issue. This has to be somehow tackled. And what are we actually doing here? Thank you. Next question, please. Will you tell me to what extent this situation is dangerous with the chemical security in Ukraine? What is particularly dangerous for Ukrainians? And how, How can one resolve the issues of uh, the chemical insecurity for Ukraine? Uh, then, I, I, of course, I, I will pass uh, uh, a microphone to, to my colleagues here in the panel. 
uh, in all three of us who were present in, in December of 2014. Everybody can probably remember the times, what times it were. We've been here in Ukraine and we brought together uh, all possible stakeholders, national and internationals, to try to find out what kind of assistance country needs with regard to chemical safety and security. And as an, one of the outcomes that was uh, made a so-called comprehensive study or gap analysis in, in the Ukrainian you know, system, which was funded and conducted by the OSCE, project coordinated by us, technically. And uh, that's quite a, that, that's not a public document. So and I, I don't want to say, and these threats and all the gaps are well analyzed. So, uh, because it's not a public document because of the obvious reasons, you know, because if, if there's a gap, maybe there are people who want to use all of, uh, of these, uh, you know, uh, uh, you could just use this situation. So therefore, uh, and basically all our projects, I mentioned three projects are now are in, in, in implementation phase, fourth is coming, and probably who knows how many else uh, projects we'll be doing um, so in the future. So these are projects based on, our, on, on the gap analysis. And, uh, and frankly speaking, uh, uh, just to, to make a short answer, to, there are uh, many areas starting from legislative and re regulatory till a very practical one, you know, like let's say equipment and training of the first responders. Because uh, I, I don't know uh, whether you've been, you know, covering some kind of state emergency service news or something, but uh, obviously the uh, equipment and the training uh, of the first responders is really outdated at, at the moment, and this is one of our tasks. So therefore, we're trying to cover the full spectrum of needs of Ukraine. Uh, I mean, the bad side of it is that we cannot do everything at once in, in one, in just in, in one action, it's in one move. And I would appreciate if, if uh, David and, and, and Shishtof will make some comments as well. Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, and you know, I, I will say that uh, the OSCE has provided great, uh, great leadership and has done great work uh, here in, uh, in Ukraine on the chemical security, uh, chemical security front. Um, you know, I, I will make a couple of broad statements about the chemical threat. Uh, you know, there is no question but that uh, that chemicals remain uh, very much in the crosshairs of those seeking to uh, to do harm. Uh, chemicals continue to be sought out, acquired, and used around the world um, in attacks, uh, chemical facilities. Um, continue to be uh, be viewed by uh, those seeking to do bad things um, as high value um, high value targets. Um, the risk, uh, from our, our perspective, uh, is really sort of twofold. Um, first, the uh, the uh, risk or the threat of chemicals um, being stolen or diverted um, from facilities and uh, used in attacks. Um, somewhere else, uh, potentially in, a, uh, in crowded spaces, public spaces. Uh, and the second, of course, is the uh, potential for uh, an attack directly on a chemical facility causing a release of chemicals into the, uh, into the surrounding community. So, you know, those are the threats uh, again, uh, against which uh, we uh, strive to protect uh, in the uh, in the United States and uh, around which we have built our framework for uh, for chemical security, um, and you know it is largely the uh, the reason uh, we strive to build um, public private partnerships uh, to build a culture of chemical security um, across the uh, community to include uh, among those uh, those industries that own and operate chemical facilities. We should not forget that the east of Ukraine was one of the centers of chemical production in Ukraine. Ukraine is one of the biggest European producers in chemicals. And uh, due to the conflict, several, uh, several facilities and installations were left, were abandoned. There are storage places with chemicals, dumped chemicals, uh, which are not attended, not protected. Therefore, there are real threats with regards to 
situation on chemical side in the east of Ukraine. We should not forget that there is uh, EU free trade agreement since 2016, which means that there is free flow of chemicals between Ukraine and, uh, and European Union. Ukraine is also an important internal hub for trading chemicals. Therefore, if you combine all these elements, we, 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 we have to say that the threats are coming from different angles, but they are not immune to, we are not immune from these threats. Poland, US, we, as, as David Wolf mentioned, uh, the, real, the, the example of tra threats, they are happening in Ukraine and in Poland, but since you have the conflicts of Ukraine and your authorities cannot undertake full control of these facilities, there are real threats. Therefore, from that perspective, we believe that the programs introduced by OEC and uh, Ukraine government are very important to prove that situation is under control and that chemicals cannot be misused for illegal purposes, whether it's for criminal, or whether it's for terrorism, or any other, uh, or for any other uh, activities. But again, I would like to stress that due to the ongoing conflict, the threat in this of Ukraine with res respect to chemicals is much higher than in other parts of the country, which are very well, I say, protected and, uh, uh, by, uh, by relevant authorities. Thank you. And uh, the next question, please. Mm -hmm. Still, I would like to clarify what steps of assistance you will be making uh, for, for Ukraine to protect uh, these uh, is, uh, chemical uh, facilities in this. And another thing, that are you particularly ready to protect to protect uh, these chemical infrastructure facilities from such natural disasters. Uh, but uh, obviously, all of us, we have something to say. Um, OEC, as a uh, as an international organization, we are here to assist Ukraine and Ukrainian uh, stakeholders by and through projects. So as bear name of our uh, office is project coordinator. We do projects. So therefore, uh, every project uh, we do has a Ukrainian partner. So therefore, we depend, if you wish, very much on the request of the Ukrainian uh, national stakeholder. So therefore, uh, if I, I don't want to just uh, go right now on cr critical infrastructure because it's still in making. And we will respond as an international organization to the request of the U uh, Ukrainian stakeholders. With, the, with regard to chemical safety and security, because these projects are already in place for a couple of years, so we, we have well-defined uh, uh, sort of structure, what we do, and we have all set of activities which we're doing together. Uh, just for example, uh, we support National Identification Lab. You know, we're just buying a, you know, large set of equipment in order to help in very modern way to identify chemicals, not just dangerous, but chemicals. This is a national level. We do support Ministry of Economic and, and Development on development of the legislation and regulations in the area of chemical safety and security, because uh, frankly speaking, that was not too much or that was outdated. Uh, and then we also helping uh, national bodyguards in order to track chemicals which are passing borders, uh, border of Ukraine uh, towards uh, well, neighboring countries. So we do actual, you know, we support in uh, expert way. We do training and exercises, tabletop exercises, real exercises. So this is the way uh, usually, you know, international organization works. Uh, with regard to uh, in, in critical infrastructure protection, I'd like to pass word uh, now to David and then to Krzysztof because uh, this will be done based on also again on the international experience and uh, on the leading countries, where, which is always U.S. is one of these countries. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Uh, yes, I, we, we in the United States uh, certainly um, remain committed 
uh, to working with Ukraine, uh, to sharing uh, the best practices we have developed, uh, not only on chemical security, but uh, on more broadly uh, in the protection of critical infrastructure. Um, yeah, and we have talked some about that uh, this morning at the roundtable, and I'm certain we will talk um, some more um, this afternoon as the dialogue, uh, dialogue continues. Um, another thing uh, I would briefly mention uh, is that I, uh, I have a role as the co-chair of uh, the Chemical Security Working Group uh, within the G7's Global Partnership. Um, both uh, OSCE and the International Center for Chemical Safety and Security and Ukraine uh, itself have been, um, have been uh, important players uh, in the global partnership. And you know, one of the uh, things we are trying to do this week uh, is to think through ways in which the uh, global partnership um, can further work with and support Ukraine as it uh, further builds out uh, its critical infrastructure protection and uh, chemical security processes, structures, um, and, uh, and frameworks. We cannot offer, I'd say, direct assistance and we cannot protect your facilities. So what we can offer is to bring best practices to show you how leaders in the world are introducing protection, what are the national capacity building in these areas, and how we are assisting local communities, especially local communities and operators, to take responsibilities for their facilities, for the chemicals they are dealing with. We believe that what we are doing in the real, we are bringing Ukraine to European Union solutions, to European Union standards, and we also came here with a clear message. Don't go national, go European, and go global. Because chemical safety and security is not a national issue. It's an issue of global importance for all of us. And building credible Ukraine in chemical safety and security is not only increasing your security, it's increasing your public image, it's increasing also your economic opportunities. Because countries which are safe in chemistry have better economic opportunities, better investment opportunities, and of course, better environment. Therefore, from that perspective, we are very proud that we met here with the real masters. We, we came here also to learn from you, from your colleagues, how you implement and how you introduce effective systems. Therefore, this is a mutual process where we are sharing with you our best practices, when we are sharing with you capacity building, when we are sharing with you solution developed within European Union, United States, in other countries, but we are also sharing with you how we are solving problems. Therefore, in our view, it's a mutual process where we are really building global chemical security. Thank you. And uh, the last question, I suppose. Yet another question, RBK Ukraine. Will you explain what finance is contemplated for projects to be implemented in Ukraine? And will you tell me we, what should be started with, as for the, with the protection of the infrastructure in the east of Ukraine or just with overall steps or over the entire part of the con country? Um, good question, because um, always uh, good big things are, uh, have to be properly funded. Uh, obviously, uh, although we believe that a uh, major part of, uh, of you know, everything should be funded by the national government, but uh, we as international organization, we are a long-standing partner and we raise a lot of money in order to implement our projects. And uh, I, I would say these three projects uh, which we are uh, conducting right now uh, on chemical safety and security, uh, it's not a yearly project. These are two and a half years, almost three years long projects, which are funded generously by the United States and European Union. This is about two million euros altogether. And uh, uh, well, the initial thought, thought I don't want to say about the increase a, a uh, response to the chemical threats in the East, uh, I think so we're talking about here about the half a million, maybe a bit more, Euros, uh, but uh, when when I say because we 
uh, in during the round table we've been uh, all of us we agreed that uh, sustainability and continuity is very much important you know and therefore we think that uh, all these projects are you know it could be extended then it could be picked up by the national governments and developed further so therefore uh, uh, I do not know about the critical infrastructure so far because we're not at this stage at, at this particular moment, but definitely it will come. Uh, but what I wanted to say that we, as OEC, as international organization, um, and uh, particularly uh, major partner countries, are uh, interested in, we're not talking about the giving money, we're talking about the support and investing in, into security. So therefore, uh, the effectiveness oh, is, is, is a key word here. So we should do the right thing. I would like to stress key point. When we talk about any investment in the area of security, where chemical security is part of that, this money should be seen as a kind of startup. In what sense? By the, this unique project developed by OEC, is supported by International Center of Chemical Stage Security, which I'm chairing, you know, are startups because implementing these small projects, we can assist Ukraine to move, as you ask question, to the whole Ukraine. And this brings direct effects through improving critical infrastructure, through reducing uh, potential risks or damages. Therefore, we should not count the money how they are coming in direct sense because the outcome is much more important. We are really very proud that the projects we are conducting are for the whole Ukraine, and they are bringing really economic, not only security, but also economic and environmental advantages for the country. And the last and not least is that it also unites Ukraine with the international system. And take into account these aspects, I believe that really we can treat this money invested by donors towards OEC, towards centers like ours, is a seed money, is a startup. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, I, I would add uh, only that, and I, I think I've said it already. Um, you know, Ukraine is focused on the right things. Um, government is is asking the right questions, identifying the right challenges. Those include, you know, not only physical security, but certainly cyber security uh, as well. Uh, cyber attacks, as you well know, on critical infrastructure can have uh, really devastating, uh, devastating consequences. And so I think certainly continuing to build out um, uh, frameworks for uh, cyber security uh, protections and addressing cyber threats uh, remains uh, a, an important uh, priority and it's one on which uh, Ukraine seems clearly uh, to be focused uh, as well as building out structures uh, to promote public-private partnerships uh, in the um, in the protection of critical infrastructure so you know all those things are you know in in my view um, the uh, the right approach, uh, and you know we remain committed to uh, to working with Ukraine as uh, you move down the uh, move down that path. Yeah, I also like to stress that we would continue tomorrow the discussions in more focused area on chemical security and volunteer fire service at the Kiev Warsaw seminar on chemical security and development volunteer fire service, which would be conducted uh, at the mayor's office. Therefore, as you can see, these discussions uh, with regard to chemical security infrastructure protection have different forms and formats. And we are very proud that we would have also tomorrow continuation of discussions with our, with Ambassador Verba, with David Lu uh, Wolf, with your mayor, with several uh, representatives from also cities from the east of Ukraine who can present their, their uh, discussions. But let me use this opportunity to stress the importance of local engagement. It is not government who has to protect society only. We have to protect also ourselves. And the best protection is coming from the local level. Therefore, one of our tasks is to assist local communities to develop their capacities, to develop the culture of protection. And one of these tasks is the local volunteer fire service, where competent people can really do much more, not only to, against fires, but on accidents on the roads, on chemical accidents, environmental situations, 
And this is a case we would like to share with Ukraine how we're doing this in Poland and how European solutions are affected in this regards. Thank you, everyone. It's high time we finished. So thank you once again. Thank you.